Welcome back. This is episode 72 of the Dear Baseball Gods podcast, and I'm here on location in Marion, Illinois, right? Mar- yep. Marion at Rent One Ballpark with the assistant coach of the Southern Illinois Miners, mm-hmm. Steve Marino. Steve, thanks for having me down here. Yeah, thanks for cool. inviting me on the show. Yeah. yeah, so we got a good backdrop. We're here in the, the Diamond Club, So, and this is your second year as a coach here for the Miners. Yep, second year as hitting coach and fifth overall at the organization. And we were just talking off camera, or off, yeah, I guess off camera, um, about all this, the new stuff you're learning as a coach, mm-hmm. just the, the guts of the ballpark, all the operations. So you right. feel like there's still a ton probably for you to learn still, right? Yeah, I mean, last year was huge being the first time I, I coached, uh, just to get to know myself and how I'm going to handle players and how I'm going to handle working under a manager and, and with the front office staff. But now that I'm kind of getting used to it and now I'm part of the front office, uh, that's been invaluable for me, you know, looking forward to this upcoming 2019 season. I kind of have a little better gauge of, of things I could do better and a little bit more of an appreciation for what everyone does here to make a baseball game work. Yeah, so if you don't know about the, the Southern Illinois Miners, they're a Frontier League team. Uh, their manager, Mike Pinto, has been with you guys since the beginning, right? Yep, He's the winningest manager in Frontier League history. He was also on this podcast maybe 15 episodes ago. So he's a really charismatic guy. Definitely check his episode mm-hmm. out. Um, but the Miners do a fantastic job. They have an amazing ballpark, as you can probably see up here behind us. Is it a $26 million facility, you said? Yeah, 26 mil. Yeah. And that was, what, 13 years ago when $26 yeah. million was yeah. actually a lot they of money? Yeah, they started construction in 2006. And yeah, that's like the average American salary. <laughs> <nowadays. laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you guys do a really good job. You're perennial winners. What was – how far? How, how was your season last year? Last year we, we came up two games short. Uh, we had 48 wins. Um, we only played 95 games. We had one rained out. We couldn't make up uh, against normal actually at monsoon at their place and even with their turf, yeah. um, <laughs> couldn't hold it. There was standing water everywhere. So we played 95 games, uh, two games short of the postseason. Very streaky team. Uh, offensively, we struggled at times, and then there would be games. You know, weekends we'd sweep a team and and just lay it on them, and then you know next week we couldn't figure it out. So. Hopefully this year we have a little bit more consistency. Yeah. So tell me about your role here with the Miners. So obviously you're an assistant coach, mm-hmm. but uh, you do a lot of other stuff, like you're living here full time in the winter. So what, what are your duties for the Miners? So, yeah, in the off season, uh, basically October through April, I'm the business development coordinator. It's kind of a new position. Uh, Mike and Kathy, our GM, uh, kind of came up with. And basically I handle field rentals, anything that goes on the f- uh, that goes on in the turf. Um, Basically, I handle coordinating it and, and making sure that people get in and, and get paid and everything like that. Um, I also do some speaking engagements. Um, I'll go to different high schools and Rotary Clubs and Lions Clubs and just kind of tell our story and, and maybe help get some more people in the ballpark. Um, and then uh, in addition to that, I'm obviously planning baseball-wise for the 2019 season, trying to find us some talent. On the offensive side, um, our pitching coach, Tyler Martin, is uh, a coach at Robert Morris University. Um, so he does a lot of the pitching side, and I do the hitting side. And obviously, Mike uh, f- facilitates all of it. And uh, he's, he's really good at finding talent. He's got so many connections. Um, so we get some good ball players in, and, and I'm kind of setting up our spring training plan for what I want to do with our guys offensively and, and how to create a, a, a way that we could go attack all the games and try to stay healthy. And so you also, uh, we're going to kind of back up and go through your story that brought you here because mm-hmm. I know. Um, you know, our intersection back in 2012 was kind of unique. Uh, if you don't know, Steve was kind of a, a, vil- a minor villain uh, in my story. He didn't know. Neither of us knew it at the yeah. time, but we'll, we'll get to that later. Mm-hmm. But uh, so you have a podcast you're starting. Um, right. And so what is the, the message that you said you speak a lot around, around the industry, uh, the schools, the kids? What's the message that you're hoping to get out in your own podcast? Uh, just to be as informative to people that, love the game of baseball, whether that be a young kid in in middle school or high school, whether that be a parent, other coaches, maybe at a younger level, just to share my experiences. And a lot of it's based on the failures I've had. So in in, in part of my podcast, I'm kind of telling my story a little bit like I'm doing now, but a lot of it's based on failure. And you're familiar with that. Every baseball player, I don't care. I suck a lot. (laughs) Yeah, everybody does, you know, and I don't care if you're Mike Trout or Derek Jeter. Well, Mike Trout, he doesn't fail. He doesn't fail that much. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. He's like a superhuman But, you know, typically my my whole theme here is to kind of tell a regular story about a a kid that came, you know, from a normal family, a normal town, and, and worked his way. And, again, by no means have I done anything 
extraordinary in the game, but I have a lot of awesome teammates, including yourself, and guys that I've met along the way that have helped me and, and taught me different things. And I'd, I just my podcast is going to hopefully share some of those experiences, successes, failures with people, and I'm going to try to have as, you know as many good guests on the show as possible and and let them tell their story and just get m- people more familiar with professional baseball, what it really is. It's not yeah. it's not exactly. I know you it's discussed not super that. Yeah. It's not, especially at our level in the Frontier League, independent ball, even pretty much every level of minor league ball. I mean, you know, double, triple A is, is an extremely tough place to get, but that's even a tremendous difference from, from the big leagues. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about that. I'm fortunate enough that I've played with a couple guys in the big leagues that I still stay in touch with. So tap into them a little bit and, and learn a couple things that they're doing and share that with the public, whoever wants to listen. Yeah, that's a, that's yeah. a good goal because as much as, like, I think the Instagram is booming and Twitter is booming with, with like, coaches and mm-hmm. people sharing – uh, it doesn't seem like there's a lot like beneath that surface level. Like there's lots of just like it, to me, Instagram's like here's a little postcard of like a thing that yeah. happened or like a drill, but there's like nothing deeper. It seems right. like it's kind of it's almost like reading a book cover when there's yeah. 300 pages in a book and you just read the cover. It, it that's easy. You know, I yeah. could I could sell you on on okay, this guy's a good swing, but why? And and I don't want to really in my in my specific case with with my podcast I'm not really going to get too much into mechanics because that's all all that stuff is just up for opinion but basically just kind of give a little bit of the guts of what baseball is you know at the college level I, I coached in college for one year I played four years of college baseball and then I've, I've played five years of pro ball and now I'm coaching in pro ball so I, I kind of have a, a wide range of, of experience that, that I have so I just want to share that with people and I, I, I think for those who want to do what we did and play or, or, or be coaches or, or be involved in the game as a career after baseball, after you're done playing, I, there's so much of the story that's not that's not told and, yeah. and just a big myth. Yeah. And for those of you listening, it's Steve joined Evansville in 2012. That's where I was playing. And you got there right probably after the draft, right? You went undrafted. Yeah, right. And then you showed up. And as a rookie, as a college guy with no experience, which we were both, that's both how we got started in the Frontier League, it's really hard to stick because I'm sure you've seen guys here, especially now as a coach, that they get their week chance or two weeks and right. they hit 140 and right. that's, that's it. it. That yeah. could be the very end of their career. Yeah, and that's you know if and that that goes specifically for independent ball. I mean, it's it's a more so than any other level of professional baseball. It's just strictly performance based. I mean, yeah. I've seen guys come in. You know, good arms come in, you, you, two bad starts, and you got to move on because it's it's the the main goal in independent ball is to win. That's how everyone keeps their yeah. jobs. That's how people come to the ballpark. So if you don't win games and if you're not a player that's helping your team win, it's it's tough to make it. You know, I see a lot of teammates yeah. that I've had and, and guys I coach. They bounce around a lot, you know, and they mm-hmm. try to find their way. And they're on three, four teams a year, and it's tough, you know. So yeah, and you know, you made the team because you came in right away and we're like, mm-hmm. who's this guy? You got your chances at third base and like right away we could tell that you played the game hard Mm -hmm. you had a good glove at third base Mm -hmm. like you made plays that our previous third baseman like wasn't making so the pitchers were all like hey (laughs) this guy's great even if he doesn't hit he's great uh and then you did hit like you hit like 305 or 310 or something like that yes I think yes 30 something yeah yeah. my first year and not a lot of power typically at third baseman well, hits I mean, more you, power. But you are. No, yeah, <laughs> yeah, but uh, you know it, that's the one part of my game I would at that point would like to have uh, done. But I, in 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 college at Stony Brook, they put such a premium on playing defense that I I took ownership of that. Like I I truly and I I mean this to my core. I I enjoyed making a nice play at third base just as much as hitting a home run. And a lot of guys don't you know they can't really yeah. say that whether they say it or not deep down. Doing something offensively, really in any sport, you know, I'm sure, you know, throwing a touchdown pass is probably, you know, more sexy than knocking one down as a cornerback. Yeah. But you know, in baseball, playing both sides as a defender, you know, I I truly liked making a, a nice play to to help my pitching staff out, and then okay, I, I get to try to score him some runs. But I, for me, 50-50 down the middle, I, I I tried to treat and and work on my defense and hitting. So it's nice to know that you know you notice that. And I mean, yeah, right know. away, guys notice it because yeah. as a pitcher especially at the higher levels of baseball, you can't allow a team to have four outs in an inning. Like right. every time you give away an out, whether it's a, you know, an error or a hit by pitch or just like you give the team more chances, they come back to kill you. Like you, yeah. especially in pro ball, guys are so good that you give them four or five outs, they're going to put up a bunch right. of runs. And so as a pitcher, all those little in-betweeners that the premium fielders don't get to, if those become outs, you're like, thank God, like that's amazing. Like I got the guy to hit the ball weekly. And some of the time in the past, my fielder couldn't get that one. But now we have a guy who can make that play. Right. And 
this is amazing. Like right. every time I get weak contact, I get an out yeah. rather than some of the time I get an out. And, and, and coaching this year, I've seen a lot of it. And, and what I've noticed more so kind of watching the game as opposed to being a part of it is you're going to, as a pitcher, you're going to give up your hard hits. You're going to give up extra base hits. You're going to get your punch outs and you're going to get your easy weak, weak outs. But out of a 27 out game, there's a couple outs or hits those, like you said, those those in between fluff ones that could go either way. Yeah. That if those are outs, yep. it's a different outcome for yeah, you. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and I, you know, you, you feel the sting because you don't. You never want to make excuses for yourself as a pitcher, but you can feel the sting sometimes when you look in the past. Like I remember our mutual friend Matt Zelinsky. He pitched mm -hmm. for Somerset in the Atlantic League when I was playing for Camden. Mm -hmm. Our <laughs> infields were very different. <laughs> <laughs> and when Matt was pitching well, he was an extremely good pitcher. He's also a former guest on the podcast. You know, he's pitching to a 3 ERA, and I'm pitching to a 4 ERA, and I'm watching, you know, against him. I'm like, man, heart, you know, we have first and second, one out. Guy hit One of our guys smokes the ball into the hole, and they had a big league shortstop mm -hmm. this one year, Edwin Masonette, um, lays out in the hole, makes the play super nonchalant, turns into a double play, the inning's over. And I'm like, <laughs> for my team, 0% of the time was that play made right. that scores a run, and now we're first and second with a run in, or first and third with a right. run in. And then when you just look at that over the long term, it's like my season, if I pitch for that team, I probably give up eight, run, eight less runs a year because right. of just they had an amazing like triple a caliber yeah. all the way around defense and i think that exact like, oh that's so and right. again you don't make excuses for yourself because of that you still do the best you can right. but you just know for a fact that he was getting a lot of help getting out of tight spots because he just had amazing defenders behind him. right and i think that exact story is the reason why now at the big league level and it's trickling down a lot of people and a lot of analytics are going towards that and and yeah. charting that you know you, you guys could have the exact same pitching repertoire you could have the exact same season effectiveness wise and your ERAs will be different your win-loss yeah. record will be different you know it, it it the game and that's part of my reason why I want to explain a little bit more from my perspective but j the game it, it's so not black and white and you could look at a box score at the end of the game it just doesn't tell the full story and yeah. and unless you're you're in it you're you're in the trenches and dugouts and really know about that stuff it, it's hard to to look because a lot of at the end of the day when your career's over unless you know people personally, your back of your baseball card and your baseball references, that's who you are. Yeah. And sometimes that doesn't tell, a lot of times it doesn't tell the full story. Yeah, so. for sure, for sure. So back up and mm -hmm. tell us where you started. So I know you're from Long Island, you mm -hmm. went to Stony Brook University, uh, five years of pro ball and I was a coach, but give us the backstory. Yeah, so grew up in Lake Grove, Long Island, I'm the oldest of five kids. Um, so I was always involved in sports, either going to watch my sisters play soccer or softball. So I was just a sport. We were a sport-oriented family from the beginning. I went to Center Reach High School. I was fortunate enough to play four years of varsity baseball. We, we weren't very good. I, I did it a couple years ago. I think we were like 18 and 76 in my four years. So we, we didn't do a lot of winning in, uh, yeah. in my career there. But fortunately, I, I got about three and a half years of varsity baseball. I, I learned a lot. It was, you know, when you're playing up three, four years, you learn a lot. So when I got to the college level um, at Stony Brook, I had a couple Division One offers. I was, I talk about this on, on a couple of my episodes in my podcast too, where um, I was very short-sighted that I knew I could play Division One baseball, and I didn't even open my mind to play anywhere else. And I strongly encourage kids not to do that. You know, I, I wanted to be a Division One athlete, and I knew I could, but I really just limited myself to only looking at those schools. Fortunately, I got a couple offers, and I picked Stony Brook. Um, which was probably the best decision I made in my baseball career. You know, yeah. your college, what you choose. And they're a good Division One program. They obviously. are, yeah. yeah. And 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 they got they, they kind of peaked. Fortunately, I I got to play with a lot of good players, and and I don't want to say peaked. Of course, they're still getting. The, the goal is to get better and go back to regionals and super regionals and all that stuff. They had but a good run though. They sure. had a very good run from probably 2008, my freshman year, uh, through like 2015. In the last couple of years, they they haven't been able to figure out how to get you know through their America East tournament, but. Um, yeah, so g going into college um, after I, I went to Center Each and, and I, I picked Stony Brook, got, you know, showed up on campus, and I'll tell you, I was probably on a 28, 30-man roster. I was probably 30 uh, talent-wise. I, I just, you know, I was a late last-minute recruit. Like the end of my junior year, uh, Coach Panucci uh, called me up and said, hey, you know, you know, we got a spot for you, books and fees, scholarship, if you could call it that. I uh, wasn't a highly recruited guy. And I had to really, really work to to break into the lineup my freshman year, and I did that, but not you know without a, a ton of, of nights where I questioned myself and yeah. I didn't know if I could do it. I really didn't know if I was a Division One player because at that level, you know, you you got so many dudes running around an infield and they're putting you here, there, and trying different things out. 
um, I, I just I questioned myself because I, I, I knew that I wasn't physically and skilled wise at, at the level of some of the upperclassmen. Um, but, you know, I, I, you know, went and worked hard in the weight room and, and got a little more physical and figured out some things. I had a lot of good mentors there and learned how to come up with a, a nice hitting approach and, and played a little defense that at a higher level. So when I did get my chance, um, about halfway through my freshman year in 2008, I didn't look back and I started ever since. So Yeah, because you're in the lineup in that conference tournament game mm -hmm. where so our schools were in the same conference, the America East, UMBC, Stony Brook, um, and you were in the lineup against me. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't know each other at the time. No, we didn't. You're just some unknown right-handed guy yeah. <laughs> um, that day in the conference tournament. And now, is he still in the big leagues, Tom Kohler? He is. He yeah. was, he's had a great career since then. Um, he was like their ace, really packed like the stands with scouts, mm -hmm. and um, we had faced him a bunch over the years, and he, I usually got his game because even though I have a <laughs> six-plus career college ERA, like I got this <laughs> plaque when I graduated, you know, like they give you something to send the seniors right. off, you know, like a big photo of me and my career stats. I'm like, can I just like get a screwdriver and scratch those off? Because <laughs> yeah. my career ERA is like 6.3. It's terrible. Yeah. My, my pro ERA is a lot better than that. Yeah. But, um, but, yeah, I mean, you guys had a fantastic team, competed really well. Like you guys were a tough, tough squad. And I didn't know you were a freshman at the time. So you're, you're a freshman Fre starting yeah. in that conference tournament game. Yeah. It's a big deal. Yeah. So Stony Brook came and went. So you played four years or five there? Four. And, and, four. and part of what you were talking about before, so 2012 I hooked up with Evansville, but I graduated in 2011. So I graduate 2011, obviously hoping and wishing to get drafted. Didn't happen. I listened to every pick of the draft. I didn't know how it worked. You know, I, yeah. I, at, at that time, you know, I, again, I'm the oldest. Now my, my brother's currently at Stony Brook, and he has four years and, and a pro career of an older brother to look at. So him and my dad and – and you know we're all big baseball fans and now us as a family is more educated so when he goes through this process and and hopefully he gets a look you know this may but um anyway w when i was doing that and i was listening to the draft i never had any contact with scouts ever no yeah. scout I, I filled out a couple questionnaires but ne never that personal connection with the scout so i just thought you heard your name and they would call you a day later and say hey you, you're going to this place i didn't know how it worked so it didn't happen so the summer of 2011 and the fall of 2011, I went to as many open workouts as possible up on the East Coast. I tried out for every minor league team you could think of with a couple buddies. I would just road trip it. I'd work from home, do some lessons, and then on weekends I would I would just hop in the car and go and, and, and try to find a place to play. And, and that continued into the winter of 2011 and 12. I would do all indoor showcases. I, you know, Red Sox, Yankees, Mets, anyone Northeast located, I would just hook up and, and just show up for these open workouts and hit and do everything. And I always performed at my best and I was one of the better guys there, but you know how it works. It's just, yeah. it's not a, there's not a spot. You're, you weren't drafted. Why weren't you drafted? There has to be a reason. I was just behind the eight ball a little bit. So that took me. So I didn't sign with Evansville until July 3rd of 2012, which was over a year after I graduated. So for that whole year, I was just going to open workouts. It's and agonizing, isn't it? Yeah, it's just, yeah. just like tormenting myself with hearing the word no after every single one of these things. And I made yeah. it work, but it was, it was a tough road. That year was a dark place in my baseball life. So, so. how did it ultimately work? Like, where, I'm sure you got, you, know, like you got in front mm -hmm. of the right scouts. You're like, I know a guy. Like, this guy's good. I'm going to vouch for you. I'm going to call. Like, mm -hmm. how did it how so, did happen? So basically it all happened within about 48 hours. So um, Tom Downey is a Philly scout. He also runs the Long Island Titans organization. Um, Tom's a friend of mine now, and he's still working there, and he's very successful. But Tom said, we got a, a workout at Lakewood in at Philly. I think it's their low or high A um, in Jersey. So okay. we're from Long Island. He goes, get in the car with me. I'm working it. Let's go. I'm taking you there. I'll, I'll push you up, and you'll get your, your reps and everything like that. So I go with him. Um, I get in front of one of their regional scouts, who's a little higher than Tom, and I hit, did everything right, made a ton of good plays at third, bare hand plays. I just showed off my skills the best I could. I ran the best 60 of my life, which was a 6.95. I'm certainly not a burner, so the, the fact that I didn't see a seven on the 60 for the first time was huge. So go. I literally couldn't have had a better workout. Of course, um, at the end, Tom says, you know, you know, we'll let you know. So day goes by, they, they're not gonna sign me. Um, this is right after the draft, so I'm sure they're signing a lot of those guys anyway. But um, so I was like depressed, kind of. You know, I, I I didn't have any direction after that. I said, I, how how long could I really do this? At some point, you got to kind of pinch yourself and say, look, maybe it's just not for me. So yeah. as I'm going to bed that night, the same night of the workout, Tom sends me a text at like midnight, and he goes, listen, man, I know you could do it at this level. I feel for you. Do me a favor and send an email to every manager and GM in independent ball you could get your hands on. 
So I, I, I didn't really want to do it. I woke up the next day after sleeping on it. I'm like, you know what? I'll, I'll give it one more shot. I'm not, I'm not getting my car. I'm not trying out for anybody anymore. I, I can't do this. I had a good enough college career. I, that should be enough. You know, why am I going to try out? So I send an email to everyone in the Frontier League, every single team. And uh, I didn't know about the Frontier League. I didn't know what it was. You know, I, th- I didn't. I, being from Long Island, I you know went to Long Island Ducks games, but I knew they were professional. But again, now I'm yeah. obviously way more educated. But so I send an email to everybody, and uh, the only team that got back to me was Evansville, and uh, got a call the next day after that. So I go to Lakewood, work out. I forget what day it was. Um, the next day I send the email. The day after that I get a call. I forget the guy's name. I don't know if you remember him from. He was like uh, the baseball ops guy at was Evansville. It, was it Bix? Bix Branson? It wasn't him. It was the it, it wasn't Andy, it wasn't Bix, it was a guy, I, I can't believe I forget his name, but he called me, and he was the one that set me up and, and everything like that. But he called me, and uh, he left me a voicemail, I called him right back, he goes, hey, you know, our third baseman's struggling, we need someone as soon as possible, how quick can you get down here? So in the matter of, like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, so literally 24 hours later, say goodbye to my family, friends, packed the bag, me and my dad were in the car and we came down. But literally in the matter of, of probably two or three days, I went from, really giving it my last shot. I went to my last open workout. Um, I, I, I've, I heard that I was just good enough not to make it enough right. where I was just going to go to work, get a regular job. And then next thing you know, Evansville called me and, and kind of the rest is history. I ended up playing for five years and, and all of it was in the Frontier League. So I'm extremely grateful to Evansville and, and to this league, uh, the Frontier League, for giving me an opportunity to play and, and you know, be able to continue my career. Because without it, you know, I'd, I, who knows what I'd be doing and my whole life would be different. Yeah, it's it's that's an awesome story. I mean, people don't realize how hard it is to be like just coasting out there alone. I don't have a place to play. Like, I I stopped being a college baseball player a year ago, and I still like I'm gonna play pro baseball. But it's like, well, you're not. <laughs> it's like, how when does that path end? Because we both did the same thing. I I graduated with Tommy John surgery, so I had to go all the way through watch my senior season go, and then I went through all through the summer, wasn't ready to play, and then just like. I networked my way and had a spring training invite the same way. But you're just like, what happens? And when is this going to resolve itself? Like, is this for me? And I think everyone deals with that, whether it's in business or something else, where it's like, when do I quit? Like, when do I give up? Like, when, how many signs do I need before, like this, like you said, this isn't just isn't for me. Exactly. It's hard to know. And and, and as a a player having friends, I'm sure you've had teammates, friends that are in the same boat. You want to do it so bad. And and Mike, I I know he he mentioned this to you, I think, in your episode with Mike Pinto. He has a a great way of looking at it. When when you get released from – whether you get released at pro ball, whether you get cut in college or high school, whatever, someone is eventually going to tell you, no, you can't do it anymore. And, and your whole life, you go through your whole life and you identify, I certainly did since I was four, if someone says, who are you? You're a baseball player, you know? Yeah. And then when that, when that day comes where you're not anymore, you just lose, it's a dark place. You, you lose your sense of identity. And I certainly went through that for quite a long time. And, and for me, it was interesting because um, I went from, you know, playing at a high level, competing at Stony Brook at the Division One level to boom, now that's over. Okay, so now I'm training. I'm getting anybody I can to hit me ground balls. I'm doing T work. I'm getting flips from anybody I can for a whole year. So I'm not super sharp, game ready. And then Evansville calls, 48 hours I'm in the car, boom, boom, boom. I'm in front of 4,000 people at Bossy Field playing. And I'll never forget uh, – the first I forget who pitched that game. It might have been you. I have no idea. The it, I, I'll never forget the day. It was, it was one of five chance. It was yeah. It was Ju- it was July third. Um, it was the day before Fourth of July, um, and it was a regular nine inning game against Schaumburg. And the first guy, I forget his name, was a little lefty, and he squibbed the first play. I'm staying at third. We're a home team, and I forget what pitch the at bat. But the first play was a slower roll to me. Come in, glove transfer throw, got the out. You know, heard a little buzz in the crowd. I'm like, holy cow, like I could do this. You know, and, and it kind of <laughs> you kind of awesome. you kind of get that that uh, you know that reassurance that okay, I'm I'm not here you know from luck or I'm not here you know. It was a long road to get here, but now that I am here, made that first play, my first at bat, I you know a little infield base hit, standing on first, so it's like an absolute elephant your piano off your back after that. Yeah, so it was pretty sure. cool. Yeah, I made my debut there as well, and that was my first pitch since college, since the game against Stony Brook. And I remember standing in there on that mound. I was pitching for normal against mm-hmm. Evansville, but it was still okay. in the same ballpark. And my host family's in the stands, my mom and dad are in the stands, and I was like, my big fear as a pitcher was always that I was going to walk everybody. Because mm-hmm. when I was a sophomore in college, when they finally, like, I was the worst pitcher on the team as a freshman. My sophomore year, I was throwing harder, I was better, I was like the number, I was the 
four slash five or five slash six where mm-hmm. I was on the cusp to be like a maybe the last weekend guy or whatever. Right. And so I was getting a piggyback start at the College of William and Mary, and our number one pitched the first half of the game that I came in, had like kind of a rocky first uh, entrance into that game, and then the next inning it was just like walk, walk, hit, walk, and I was yanked. <laughs> and after that, I guess that's where it started. Um, I just was always – my always pregame fear was – what if I go out there and it's walk, 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 yank? Right. And I was out there in that same ballpark in Balsy Field, like all those people, because it was just like the second day of the season. Mm-hmm. So then I mean, they get a good turn yeah, out there. Do. And it's like, what's going to happen? And then it just like, like you said, it just takes over. My first pitch was a strike right down the middle. And it was like, ah. Right. And then, of course, my second pitch, the guy hit a line drive off yeah. my leg. <laughs> but, you know, you, you yeah. move past that. Yeah. But. And it's, it's interesting, too, because, like, People don't – there's so many deep, deep things, and, and by no means are any of them an excuse for a baseball player, but you played your career at UMBC. You're comfortable there. You you play at different ballparks in the America East. You pitched at Stony Brook, all these different places. So when both of us now, you, you go make, you make your first start, I make my first uh, appearance as a player at Bossy Field, your sights are different. It's different when there's more people there. It's different when the distance between home plate and the backstop is a little bit more, a little less. The dugouts, are, it, it's just different. You, yeah. you're, the, the vision of the game and what you see is different. And people don't really take that into account, of course, it, it's 60 you know, feet, six inches. It's 90 feet bases. You know, it's grass and dirt. It's the same game. It's the same field, technically. But just just setting your sights, I mean, I've, I've never pitched after high school. But, I, I mean, I remember being on a mound. You're literally on an island. It's literally not. I give so much credit to you and any pitcher at any level, at yeah, a high level. Yeah, yeah, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it's frustrating, you know, when your offense scores 10 runs and you give up 11 on a pitching staff. So hey, that doesn't sure happen is. too much. Yeah, yeah but, but it goes both ways, I'll tell you that. But, uh, yeah, it's just people don't realize how, how much of a change it is to just, I mean, baseball players, I don't care if you're making $25 million or $25 a day, it, you're human beings, you know, and, and people don't give – you know, us as, as players, coaches, I think enough credit at times where we're not robots, we're human beings. Human being performance is impossible to measure really day to day, year to year. So, you know, guys sign in for big signing bonuses and they go to a different place, it doesn't pan out. It's not necessarily, I'm not saying it's not their fault, but it's, there's a lot of factors that go into it that people don't realize is yeah. really. Yeah, and that so. evokes a big memory here because I think I made my, either my second or third career start of my rookie mm-hmm. year here and this park is really built up, like it's really tall. And I felt like a little ant right. walking out and there was a big crowd, it was really loud. They have a big production here. Mm-hmm. And just walking out of that bullpen where there's this, you know, 20 foot, you know, uh, retaining wall and then another 15 right. feet of like big jumbotron. Right. And I'm walking out, I'm like, this is not like anything I've experienced right. because we got 90 fans and they're all moms and dads mm-hmm. at, in college. Mm-hmm. And then even a, at Bossy Field, it's uh you know it's like one one deck it's like expansive and there's lots of people but it's not this this feeling of like a major league stadium where you feel right. small but here you definitely feel small on that field because of the way it's built up and the architecture and that's a whole new thing to contend with oh yeah like walking in here at Rent one park you walk in and the the top of the the seating the top of the the cell where you sit and the bowl is ground level. So you the field is underground, technically. Mm-hmm. So when you walk down, you walk down the big staircase and the bullpens are underground and, and you really get the sense that you are kind of in a, a fishbowl and everyone else is kind of looking down at you. It, yeah. And that's just one ballpark. I mean, we've both played at, at probably hundreds of different places in our lives and every, every single place in college, pro ball is a little different. And you just gotta get, you gotta set your bearings, you know? At, at the end of the day, you know, when I stepped into a box, I'm sure when you get on the mound, you lock in, it's you and the catcher, or it's me and the pitcher, and you ha- kind of have that tunnel vision. But there's a lot of times during a game where you get to kind of soak it in, and, and it could go either way for players. Some guys, you know, the, the bright lights make them better, and some guys, they, they don't really know how to figure out to, to be able to perform under pressure like that. Yeah, and you can even see it, and I, I do think to your sentiment earlier that people discount, like, the humanity in players. Like, mm-hmm. even, like, you see guys in the postseason, and I remember distinctly this year, with the Yankees, they had a, a, a young lefty who was like dominated in double A, dominated in triple A, and then had like a decent like September call up. Mm-hmm. Like he had some innings for the Yankees in their mm-hmm. bullpen. And he was visibly nervous pitching in like the ALCS or whatever. Right. Um, Cause he was just, he like th- was not even close to the plate, threw him behind the guy, then yeah. threw one up and in. Then the next one was behind him again. It's like, this is an example and you don't see it that much in the major leagues, but it was a clear example, at least to me that of a guy who was just sped up and who was right. nervous and who yeah. was like, this is my first ALCS. 
I can't calm my heart rate down. Right. And when you've lived that, you understand it. But I'm sure so many fans watch that game and they're like, who is this guy? He sucks. Like, he doesn't suck. He like he, he looked at his numbers. He belonged yeah. in the big leagues. Right. But he just got a chance in the postseason, mm-hmm. you know, where millions of people are watching at home. Right. And it yeah. was, it, you know, like, I don't know if my heart went out to him because, like, we'd all love to be there. Right. But you just know what he's going through. And sure. it's so hard once it starts happening. Like, you, you let one go and you're like, oh, God, that one behind him. Yeah. <laughs> and then you're like, don't do that again. Yeah. Don't do that. And, of course, what happens when you do that, it, it happens it's again. It's a snowball. It just, it's yeah. snowballs. It's, yeah. It's, it's, so tough and it's not just baseball i think it's anything you start a new job you do something for you drive for the first time you go to school for the first time like i mean i don't remember it vividly but i know i was nervous when i went from middle school to high school you walk into a bigger place there's seniors and you're 13 14 years old and there's 18 year olds and yeah it's like you look up it's like so it's the same thing in baseball and and like i said with anything where where you're tracking and, and your performance as a human being is is based on whether you have a job or not i mean that it's a tough thing to do and and we i always say in one breath i'm saying yeah it's tough and you know cut us a little break fans but at the same time we all chose this life and yeah. and we know what we know what we're getting into and we've played baseball for a long time and now coaching it and we talk, i completely every every morning i wake up and i come to the ballpark as a coach i know exactly what i'm getting into and any any type of negative feedback from a fan or a player or another coach or anything I know that that's part of the job description and you just have to deal with it and if you like it and love it enough you, you keep doing it if you don't there's plenty of other things you could do so yeah so tell me about the transition so obviously <clears throat> first as a player like what were the things that stuck out to you right away when you signed with Evansville started playing and like settled into your daily role mm-hmm. what were the differences between college and pro ball um, certainly the sense of more personal accountability um, I'll never forget, but walked into my locker and sat on my locker and Matt Krim and Garrett Bullock were my left and right locker mates. Mm-hmm. And the first thing that they two said, starting pitchers. two starting pitchers. So I, again, I was told to go there. It was an empty plate or two you left-handed know, t- starting pitchers. Left. The yeah. Plot Little, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, yeah. The quirkiness was a uh, 10 out of 10. So um, the first thing that I forget who said it, he goes, you know, you're the eighth guy to keep this locker, right? And, <laughs> So that, that so I started my pro career nervous as anything. I don't even have my clothes hung up yet in, in the locker, and I find out that I'm the eighth guy to have the locker, and it's only July 3rd. So clearly the third base position needed some help. And I don't know why I said this, but I was like, oh, don't worry, I'll be the last guy to hold it. And I just can't <laughs> believe I said that. I'll never forget it. It's just a couple, you know, in your career, there's certain, you know, conversations you have with people. But I don't know why I said that. I'm not like that at all. I don't, I'm not that self-confident and cocky that I would say that. But, but you I have did. to be in your own head, though, right? right? Like, you might yeah. not say that out loud because you're a humble right. guy, but in your head – Right. I, and I've, I've definitely thought that before in my yeah, life. But that sure. was the first time it came out to two guys I have no idea about, and they both have pitched at, at higher levels than I've ever been at. But, the, j- you know, piggybacking that story, basically what I found out was guys up here were confident. They belonged here. They knew it. There was no type of timid play. They got out there and they got after it because you have to. If, if you have that shadow of a doubt, it's probably going to come out in your performance. So just the the, the – the, op- the opportunity really to be self-accountable and not really – of course, it's a team sport and, and we wanted to win as a group and we had so many talented guys on that, that 2012 team. But just guys did their thing. They took their rounds of BP. You know, there was no panic. It was just a, a loose atmosphere where guys did their thing. They knew they were going to, you know, show up at 635, 705 game start, you know, whatever, and, and go after and compete. And another thing I learned is it wasn't like the end of the world when – we lost or we you know had a bad game personally in college there's there's not as many games there's a ton of guys sitting around watching you play that want your job and have an opportunity there's you know now d1 roster limits 35 the frontier league's 24 so i'm looking on the bench and i'm playing third base it's like okay there's one extra infielder one extra outfielder and a backup catcher that's it that's your bench so the 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 sense of hey i got to perform tonight uh, there's not going to be like okay you know sit down for a couple of days and we'll have, you know, Billy over here take over and you'll get back to it. It's, it's you're done. So there was a, a certain heightened sense of pressure for me, but I just tried to, to, you know, calm myself down. And, and I had a, a lot of good role models to go off of from that team. And I made friends quick, but um, the, the biggest thing I would say is definitely that accountability of you have to perform and there's no excuses. And if you don't perform, you're out. And if you perform, you're going to have a job for a long time. Yeah, and it was, I'm sure, nice for you that you got off to a really hot start. Like, you're just killing the ball to start, and mm-hmm. I'm sure that takes a, just a ton of pressure off you. Where, for me, I always sort of, like, thought of my good performances as, like, 
tokens. Like mm -hmm. I pitched well today, that earns me at least two bad starts right. before <laughs> I get released. So you like keep accumulating. Yeah. You're like, all right, my ERA is pretty good. That means I could probably pitch like crap for a whole month, right. and I'd still be okay. Your leash gets a little like, longer. Yeah, your yeah. leash gets longer, <laughs> where you can just like figure it out. But if you start off bad, you know, you go 0 for your first eight. If you go right. 0 for the next eight, it's see you later. That's time. it. That's it. So. Yeah, and I was lucky enough to, like I said, get a first my first hit and my first at bat. I ended up going one for four in my first game. I remember it, and but it was enough to say, okay, he kind of belongs. Like you got that feeling. Mm -hmm. I got that feeling myself, which is pretty much the most important. At the end of the day, yeah. You know, as a player, your fate is really up to either the manager or the GM or whoever in scouting is up to, to making decisions. But um, it, the belief in yourself and, and if you feel like you belong, you're going to play better. If you, if you feel like, wow, I don't really belong in the field. I can't believe I'm doing this. It's just a matter of time before you probably end up going home. Yeah. Do you remember there was a rift between the team, between me and the hitters about probably like a, maybe like a couple weeks after you got there? Do you remember this? This, I, this there was like a, start shout, a shouting match in the dugout I between me and two other hitters. I don't remember that. <laughs> What's interesting to me is like the dynamic between pitchers and hitters because there's definitely like a click, like a like a divide, and I'm sure right. you still see this sure. as, a, as a coach because you guys do your thing, we do ours, and we help each other. But when things are not going <laughs> good from one side, like you said, hitters, you know, you give us ten runs, and we give up eleven. Yeah. That breeds some discontent. Yeah. But I uh, I wasn't sure if you would remember that where. It was something – it was with that pitcher, Matt Krim. So, Matt mm -hmm. was a lefty. Um, he and I were close. Like, the whole starting rotation, like, we were pretty close mm -hmm. that year. And Matt was 0 for 6 or something. And he only mm -hmm. had, like, a 4.2 ERA. Mm -hmm. And there was actually an all-star that year who had a similar – like, a 4.1. Like mm -hmm. And he was on a better team. It was actually on this team. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like – and Brooks, who was our pitching coach, confided in me for some reason, because he'd known me from the past, and he told me things I didn't want to know, which was who was going to get released soon. Okay. He would tell me all these things that were happening. I'm like, I wish I didn't know that, because now I have to go like hang out with that guy, look him in the yeah. eye, knowing that he's basically like a walking dead. Yeah. So he's like, yeah, your boy Matt, he better pitch well tonight, because uh, the front office, like the owner wants him gone. Jeez. I'm like, why? He's like, because he's 0-6. But I'm like, his ERA is not bad. He's like, I know, I know, I've been fighting to keep him here, but he's like, you know, 0-6 just looks bad, it's embarrassing, like, he's like, we got to get rid of him, so this was, this was like his last night to start, basically, yeah. so I'm watching nervously as my buddy pitches for his life, kind of unbeknownst to him, but probably beknownst yeah. to him, because you're 0-6, smart guy, yeah, but we pitched against a guy who had a, a decent fastball, but a really good curveball that night, uh, and our hitters were just like punching out left and right, after like five innings, they had like 10 strikeouts, and Matt was pitching equally well, it was like a 0-0 game. And at some point, I just became fed up as our hitters swung through a high fastball and then took a called third strike right down the middle on a curveball <laughs> over and over and over. And I, one of our hitters finally, like, swung on a first pitch high fastball, hit it to the wall, got caught. And as he's trotting back in, I kind of go, like, finally, like, someone's making an adjustment. Someone's trying, which is not a very, like, <laughs> Smart democratic thing, yeah. thing to say. But two hitters naturally cock their yeah. head over and go, what the, you know, yeah. do you mean by that, yeah. blew it? And this was a moment in my life, too, because I'm not, like, an aggressive, like, get-in-your-face, like, fight kind of person. But I was, like, I remember, like, the two, the devil and the angel, and they're, like, yeah. you should just, like, ignore it, and it'll go away. And this one's, like, no, screw him. And I'm, yeah. like, all right, I'm going with you. <laughs> yeah. I'm, like, you guys, he's out there battling for his life, and you guys are just striking out the same way yeah. in the fifth inning that you were in the first right. inning. Make an adjustment. He's battling for his life, and you guys aren't even helping him. Yeah. So it became this big shouting match in the dugout. Um, and after that, I could just feel that I was the enemy of all the, of all the hitters. <laughs> yeah. So I wasn't sure if you were like in like the, the, the Bible study group where you guys were just bashing me in the background. I, or not. I'm sure I, you weren't. But. I know for a fact that I, I'm not trying to say, oh, I'm a good goody two shoes. I know I wasn't. And I, the reason I, I know that I wasn't, I think it was pretty early into when I yeah, got there. I was. And I was kind of, I tried to stay off, you know, in the background as much as I could because I didn't. My voice as a rookie doesn't need to be heard, and I don't need to be making a splash like that. So whatever beef it was, it clearly – and listen, that, that story, that was your – that was a story that was – that's history now. But that same type of thing happens yearly in every dugout, yeah, in every sure. clubhouse. I know it. And one of our best pitchers this year, I think at, at the All-Star break, was like 2-4 and four or 1-5, and five, something like that, with like a 3-something ERA. And we just – kind of like had ace syndrome, you know, and we just didn't score for him. We, you know, we'll put up 10 runs the night before. Okay, here comes Gino. He's going to throw tonight. He scored one run, and he yeah. gave up two. And, and his ERA kept going down, and his losses kept going up. It just – it wasn't right. But it, I, 
my thing is, and it's really tough to, to blur these lines, but which would be awesome on a team, and to have full team unity, and, and you're never going to have pitchers and hitters. It's, it's, a, it's a riff that's going to happen till the end of time. But the way to do it is if you know at the end of the day, every hitter, I hope, is not trying to give up any any at bat. You get four or five at bats a night. Not one of them should be given up. Okay, whatever. I'm just gonna you know swing and that's yeah. it. And, and the same thing on the on the pitching side. Every pitcher is going out there battling their tail off, and they deserve. Every pitcher deserves run support. I think I have a greater now as a as a coach. I have a greater ap- appreciation for pitching staffs as a whole. Not only the starting four, five, six, but but also the bullpen. You know, guys that they don't you don't play every day. You know, you don't know when your name's gonna get called. It, we we come into the ballpark. We get here at two by four o'clock. The lineup's up. I know where I'm hitting. I'm hitting six today. I'm playing third base. Great. I get the whole day to prepare. If you're a reliever, <laughs> you might get your you might get hot three times and not get into a game. You might get hot twice and then the game settles down. Oh, it's a one run game. I gotta get hot again. And you're in the and you're yeah. in the game. It, it's it, the appreciation for a pitching staff for me went up and through the roof. Just watching them work and not having to be part of an offense and get defensive. Oh, we didn't score. You know, sometimes as a leader of the team, you have to be. Hey, you know, we're not trying to give up bats. Do your own thing. You get outs, we'll get runs. We'll we'll take care of it. You yeah. know, those those conversations I don't think will ever end, but they can be avoided more often than not because um, you know sometimes it's just listen. You know, you're a competitor. It's your boy out there throwing, mm-hmm. and I think everything you said was 100 percent accurate. You know, if you're as, as a as a pitcher on the team. If you could see that an adjustment needs to be made in our, our nine guys that are hitting, why can't we as professional hitters? Yeah. You know, it's very frustrating at times. Yeah, and it's not like I could like crowd them around, hey, hey, hitters, so here's what he's doing. Mm-hmm. Here's what you should do. It'd still be the same, like, here's yeah, all my right, little yeah, things. Yeah, right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's just one of those things where, I don't know, it was a frustration boiling over, and it uh, it resolved itself. He stuck around and, and started to get some wins and yeah. still continued to pitch well. Because I think that game we lost like 2-1, to one, but he – do like six or seven good innings yeah and they're like all right we won't get rid of them yeah so and i remember actually now that you say that i remember because i got close with matt matt was actually my teammate here in southern after that um but i remember when when brooksy took the ball from him that night i think he came out in the middle of an inning i, I kind of have a, a memory I of feel like that's tr- that's I, I don't know if he went six and two thirds or if he pitched into the seventh he pitched six seven plus and he came out in the middle of, and i i i saw a sense in brooksy and in matt that like whew, you felt that kind of deeper. Okay, I'm 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 gonna be here. I I, I think I, I remember that kind of exchange when the ball was exchanged of uh you know good job buddy like you know you saved your yourself you know yeah. and and I, I, that's that's great to see you know and you get so close with teammates it's the the biggest I think the biggest challenge as a teammate and now certainly on the other end as a coach is watching guys go you know and and they have to you know no team in in frontier league like I said we have 24 man roster. When, when you break camp, and, and it's this year we start May 10th, so I am guarantee you right now the team on May 10th in Southern Illinois is not going to be the same team on September 2nd when we're done. Mm-hmm. It's just <laughs> it, there's going to be interchangeable parts, unfortunately, and, and that's based on performance. So as good of an arm or as good of a defender or a bat you have, at some point if, if you struggle enough, it's, you're gonna, they're going to make a change and move on. Right? Yeah, what do you think? I know my, my first year 10 guys were left at the end. From the opening day roster, mm-hmm. I think that was actually pretty rare. Right. So I think it's probably yeah. typically like six or eight, something right. like that. Something like that is probably right. I think last year with the minors, I think we had 14, 15 out of 24 that were that's, still here. That's a lot. But but what what people, you know, what kind of it's a lot, yes. But the other 10, 11 guys were were a revolving door, yeah. and and that's the the part that. When we, and I think it's like this in the draft, in, in any level of professional baseball, but when you're drafted, when you're signed to an independent contract, the, the goal is for you to be there all year. Someone has, has seen something in your ability where if you perform, you will have a job for at least that year. And then obviously age restrictions and guys get married, guys you know have children and stuff, life changes. But for that year, so in 2019, we, we're going to bring in you know, 36, 38 guys to camp. 24 will break, break camp and, and be on our team. Ideally, we'll go to war for 96 games with those 24. But someone or multiple guys are not going to perform, and we're going to have to replace them. That's how it works. Yeah. So your day-to-day as a coach, um, is it correct that your wife and your little one are here? Yep, yep. yep. We live uh, about a little over an hour north of, of the ballpark. So, okay. Yeah. How was it during the season? I know there's tons of travel, obviously. Like, how do you guys uh, balance all that? Yeah, it, it, it was this this year was was tough. We 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 moved here in April for spring training, and my wife Maggie was eight months pregnant. 
Um, so we moved here without a baby, and then three games into the season, we had opening day against Lake Erie here. I coached uh, third for three games, and then she went to labor that next Monday or Tuesday. Team was on a road trip, so I didn't make the trip. Um, the team was super. Uh, they work with me unbelievably, and, and they gave me two full weeks. They would have gave me more, but I felt two weeks was enough. We had uh, little Mila at on uh, May 18th. So we went from my first coaching experiences, move into a new apartment in a different place, uh, go through spring training. We don't see each other. My wife's at home, eight months pregnant, going through whatever she's going through. And then we have our baby. Two weeks, I'm without the team, so I kind of like felt like I lost touch a little bit. I'm listening to every game on the radio, but there, that personal feel, the dugout was gone. Um, I, I joined the team back for a homestand and coached the rest of the year. But you know, you go, go to a go on a six game, seven game road trip where you're on the bus, and you know, we try to FaceTime, we try to stay in touch, and and we obviously do. We text all the time, and you know, there's just built in parts of the day when I'm throwing BP or when we're in the field. You know, you just you know, you, you're not in contact with your loved ones, your spouse. And that was a tough transition. I think this year will be a little easier for us, but Maggie has been super supportive. She knows that this is my dream and she supports it. She came to, I'm sorry, Mila at 12 days old, came to her first professional game. And she, by the time she was four months old, she saw 42 professional games. So Maggie did a real good job of, of sitting in the crowd with a one, two and three month old little baby. And, you know, just for me, you know, watch me coach. It's not like I'm even playing. So as a coach, you know, I, I do very little. You know, I put on the sign every once in a while. I, I do my charts in the dugout and, and wave some guys in. Hopefully, a lot of guys in at third base. But other than that, it's not a real uh, sexy life to be the spouse of a coach because there's really not much fun stuff that I do. But she got connected with the players, and you know, I was, she was up to date on roster transactions, stuff like that. And so, uh, it, it, it's great. You really need a support system like that. You know that. And um, being married now, I, I wasn't married when I played, but now being a coach certainly is different. You have really two lives. You have like your players that you look out for. And, and when I'm in, in from like basically 1.30, 2 o'clock to 11, they're your kids. Like I have to look out for them. Like my job is to make sure that they're doing whatever they can to go as far as they can in the game, get picked up or have a really good season for us and help us win. And then you go home and I have a wife and a baby to take care of. So it's, it's two different hats I wear, but I love both of them. You know, I love being a dad, being a husband is great. And, and being able to do both, being a coach and being – um, a husband and a father at the same time, uh, it's special. I love it, and uh, it's a new journey, and we'll, we'll go through year two now, and hopefully it'll be better than last year. So. Yeah, I'm sure that's a lot, to just to balance and keep communication up, mm -hmm. and and just I'm sure you have a lot of, like you said, a lot of people that you're trying to make sure all the mouths are fed and everything's together. I'm yeah. sure you have the, the late night trouble with the team, you know, here and there, you know, whatever, sure. you get a call, something happened, or yeah. someone's stumbling around whatever it is and you got to take care of that stuff i'm sure the drags you out of bed once in a while yeah but absolutely off sure. days too you know off days aren't always off days in the frontier league this year and, and and for quite a while in years past every monday for the most part besides one or two is off but you know guys need early work and it's an off day and they're struggling you know deep down i'm i'm myself and the other two coaches that are we make decisions on guys playing careers so i'll i'll know hey this guy's one for his last 12 He's kind of on rocks, and, and I'm going to get in here and do work with him because I want him to be around. It's best for him. And so there's days where seven days a week I'm here for a good portion of the day, and, it, and that's tough for a family life. But fortunately, you, in the seven months that's, quote, unquote, the off season, you try to make as much time for family as possible and give it back to him in that way and spend some weekends together and, and do, make little trips here and there. So it's kind of a give and take, but during the season, it's, it's very difficult to manage both. Yeah, for sure. So with all these new guys that you're working with, like last year being your first year coaching, um, do you feel like they're speaking a different language than you spoke when you were a player, like at their same age, you know, seven, eight years ago? Mm -hmm. Like, do you feel like today's brand new, fresh rookie player is significantly different than you were back in, back in your day? Uh, not... Not so much. I think it's it's How similar. Often you guys talk about launch angle. Uh, for you me, some launch angle, yeah, maybe yeah, yeah right, run, yeah, right. right. <laughs> for me, does that, that brings up a great point. So I'll answer your question in a second. But the whole, you know, what, I'll just use launch angle as a thing. It's not so much that. It's that our infield last year consisted of someone from the Royals organization at first, Astros organization at second, White Sox organization at third, and University of Tampa at third base. So that's. That's four, so I'm just using the infield. Now, in the outfield is different, catching, whatever. But just our infielders, we had four guys from, one from a rookie out of college, 
and the other three were from three different organizations. So they all have their own philosophies that they were taught and acquired mechanical things that they do and, and different drills. Okay, one guy likes to do two hours worth of early work before a game. Another guy takes his five swings, he's done. I have to adapt to that. I can't possibly say, okay, guys, this is how we're going to do it. it. As a hitting coach, number one, I don't think that's the right thing to do. Every single hitter is unique. Everyone has different mechanics. Everyone has a different approach that works for them. And second, th I, don't, I think you lose the buy-in, and I think you lose the trust of your players if you do that. So I, I don't think that they're much different. Um, rookies coming in and, and guys, I just think that there's because of the, the 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 hitting game, because of Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, and all the new terminology, we're all doing the same stuff. Everyone wants to go drive the ball in the gap, drive the ball over the fence, get on base at a high clip, and and help the team win. We all want we all have the same goal. It's just the language is different. So yeah. for me, I'm I'm almost like I consider myself almost an interpreter for 12 different hitters because it's like, okay, this guy says he wants to get on on his backside a little more and create more backspin. Another guy wants to do the same thing, but he's going to describe it and it, with his body a different way. Yeah. So I have to be well versed in all of the language. That's why I'm, I'm as active as I can on social media to try to learn all this stuff, whether I agree with it or not. It's not the point. It's I know that this year we're going to have 20 hitters come to camp, 12, 13 of them will make the team. That's going to be 13 different swings that I have to, to learn and, and learn how to speak the language and how to get through to them. So I think the biggest difference from when we played back together when I was a rookie in 2012, you know, fast forward now, it's 2019. I think the biggest difference is that there's not, there used to be more of a universal language and now it's very much more individually based on, on, on guy to guy. So I think that's the toughest part for me. I'm still learning, you know, learning how to work through that myself. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I'm, uh, the Twitter, <laughs> the Twitter universe is super mm -hmm. frustrating. Mm -hmm. I mean, everyone, I think, you know, your attitude about kind of like staying out of it and just like observing and being in the know and being part of it while not pulling your hair out right. is probably <laughs> the way to go because, God, everyone just yeah. wants to say everyone else is wrong. I'm right, or right. let me let me get in a Twitter fight with this guy yeah. about why he's horrible and doesn't understand anything, and I'm the smartest person exactly. ever. And like no one ever. Like no, no it, it's pointless. Out. Yeah, it's it's crazy. And the, the, another thing is like that. It's it's really easy to sit wherever you are and fire your thumbs 140 characters and and be a tough guy. 280 now. Oh, is it 280? Yeah. Oh, that's right. It is a little longer. Yeah, I noticed yeah, that. Okay. Yeah. Well, 280. So it, even more. It's even worse because now they could yeah, have so more of their opinion. Firing. And listen, everyone's entitled to opinion. I've put things on Twitter. It's my own opinion. If you don't like it, unfollow me. No problem. But. To go back and forth and slide into a DM or to comment on different things, you know what I mean? It's, <laughs> I don't know why I'm laughing because it's yeah. slide in my, slide in my I, DMs. Guys do that. I mean, I got into one riff with a guy once, and never, I'll never do it again, but I commented on a thing, and it, we just went back and forth, and he kept saying, I forget the guy's name, I forget where he was from, whatever, but he was a, a hitting guru guy and had his own facility, and I just didn't agree with something, so I said, I, I don't agree with this, I think this is damaging to this poor kid, he's going to pop out 300 times this year, and he's probably going to quit baseball, you know, <laughs> it, there, I think one of my, my biggest things, if, if we're talking about the mechanics of stuff, I don't think we could teach a pro guy or a big league guy or a college guy for that matter the same thing we could do in, in a cage with a kid that's taking his first lesson at seven i just don't think we could do it their bodies aren't i, I can't teach a seven-year-old chris bryant swing i can't do that it's not right i mean i can and maybe he'll get it but he's not strong enough to drive the ball out of a, a little league field yet you got to teach him the the real basic you know keep it as simple as possible get people coming back to the game not so much lessons but Let's 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 have our best athletes stay in the game of baseball. And not get fr it's the biggest failure sport. And I just did an episode on my own thing on it on like how youth baseball is running right now. And I just feel like we we might be at a point where we're chasing some of our better players out of the game because it's strikeout thirty times in a fifty at bat little league season. And I, daddy, I don't want to do this anymore. And we're not giving them you know the right direction that that's okay. But yeah. at the same time, let's work together and let's get better in the right way and not try to have don't look at look don't look at guys on tv and try to do that you, you're not 6'2 220 pounds yet when yeah. you're that age yeah you could you could imitate chris bryan and and you know pool holes and trout name your guy that you could want to you want to swing like them great but you got to be physically ready to do that and i think sometimes at the younger levels you know, you see on Twitter these guys doing all these different drills with a, a little kid. It's like, he just can't do yeah, that Yeah, they're yet. just, like, hitting the ball way. Yeah. Up, like, I mean, like at the top of the cages are getting abused. And, and, like, listen, if, like, Bryce Harper, if he hits a ball at the top of the cage, that dude's strong enough where he could miss a ball and he could carry it out in the third row. A 15-year-old in high school, that's a pop-up to shortstop every single time. And 
and I, I see it, and I really have to fight and not press send it's on hard. a lot of stuff. Yeah, because, you know, like, for me as a hitter, like, I was reading swings for, you know, my job. And I see these swings on, on social media. I'm like, that swing I've literally never seen one time in every bat of pro baseball. Right. Never seen one guy swing like that. Right. Not because they, they <laughs> haven't figured it out, because they have figured it out, and that's not the way to do right. it. Like, you cannot hit this pitch, this pitch, this pitch, this pitch. You'll hit – if they hit – if I throw it into your bat, you'll hit a home run once right. in a while. And that's a great point that you just made. As a pitcher, uh, and, and at this level, at the college and certainly in the pro level, you, you take your first at bat and you read my swing, you're facing me. I know for a fact that I'm going to do something, and right away you're going to say, oh, he looked pretty – he had a good pass on that. I'm not going to go back there again. Or he's casting out. I'm going to bust him inside. Mm -hmm. Different. There's just different things that you see in cues that if, if we're instilling these kids with these – major f all or nothing golfy swing. exactly you know and it's like listen can it work yeah it can work but i just i'm more in the camp of have a good at bat you know stay flat through the zone be balanced make sure you're seeing the ball swing at strikes take balls it, break it down as easy as possible when the hitter gets that okay now you want to increase your power okay now we'll tweak some stuff now you want to you know maybe work on your backside gap power and backspin balls to the backside Okay, now we can work on that. But it has to come with the foundation. And I think a lot of our Twitter coaches and a lot of people in the country that are, are hitting gurus and hitting coaches now, I'm, it's great that they're volunteering or getting paid for their time. doesn't matter. They're, they're in the trenches working. But I just think that maybe we're biting off a little too much we could chew at the, at the younger levels. And that's trickling up to the higher levels because then they get to high school and they can't hit 86 at the belt because their swing goes underneath it every time. So yeah, it's it, it's, it, there's got to be a balance. Yeah, and it was actually Alex Bregman commented on a hitting guru on Twitter. Maybe it was like maybe like three or four months ago. Um, and this guy was just like showing off this kid who starts his swing, hands basically drop to his back pocket, mm -hmm. and then he's going uppercut and hits just a mm -hmm. you know cage bomb. And, mm -hmm. and, and Bregman's like, this swing doesn't doesn't play at the, at the higher levels. He's like, right. hands are dropping too much, too steep, whatever. And the guy responds back with photos of Joey Votto and someone else. And he's like, are you sure this doesn't play? And it's like, Joey Votto's swing looks literally nothing like right. that kid's swing. Like, why are you even saying that? Yeah. It's like they're taking <clears throat> different examples and saying that it's, it's, it's evidence for swinging this way. And then Bregman just kept firing back like two or three more messages and then it was done. But he's like, nah kid's gonna get eaten up alive yep. inside and here and, and he was 100 percent right yeah. and it's the same thing I, I expressed earlier it's like i've never seen a high level hitter swing a bat in that way yeah and that's what's just like coming out right now and it's like is hit tracks really like telling us what we should do and you know you're a good example yeah. and i had a teammate who was a lot like you in college you probably remember playing against him sean Retz, and sure. he was a great player for umbc tried to get signed couldn't get signed um, but he hit like 25 doubles and like a handful of home runs every year. He's a really strong guy. Mm -hmm. Like you're a very strong guy. Mm -hmm. uh, still wasn't like a home run hitter. Right. And you say, well, oh, he's just be lifting the ball. It's like he knew himself pretty well. And I feel like you probably knew yourself pretty well where if you stay in the line drive, double mm -hmm. gap to gap mode with the occasional, you know, I get one, I can pop it out. Right. That was what kept you in the game for five right. years. But if you automatically just switch, like how many extra home runs are you going to hit? for the higher percentage of pop-ups or deep exactly. fly balls you're going to hit. Exactly. Like I, you know. The risk-reward here is, in my opinion, we're going to, in a lineup, one through nine, each guy, you're going to get the home runs that you're going to get. You know, if I'm a 10-home run guy, whether I really work all offseason for six months on changing my swing to the point where maybe my attack angle or launch angle, when I make contact, again, I think the big, a launch angle every single thing launch angle isn't a swing launch angle is a degree of measuring the, where the ball leaves the bat and and at what angle and there's better launch angles than others so <clears throat> there's a lot of the way we talk about it a lot of people are uneducated about it and they're big mouths or big thumbs on twitter and it's easy to do that but i think can i create like i went from in 2015 i hit eight home runs and in 2016 i hit 16 and i led the team in home runs so i literally doubled my home run production I did, I'm telling you right now, I did not change one thing about my approach. What it was was instead of top spinning a double on a hanging breaking ball, in 2016 it was a home run. A changeup that floated instead of me being out in front and pounding it into the third base dugout foul, I learned how to just stay back and hit it over the fence. It, and I, but my intent wasn't to, to hit the ball over the fence. My intent was still line drives in the gap. And I'm not, 
I'm not saying having a line drive and a gap approach or goal is the best. There's, do whatever you got to do as long as you're productive. But in, in college, my junior and senior year, I led the, the conference in doubles my junior and senior year, not in home runs as a third baseman. Did that hurt me a little bit? I don't know. It didn't matter. I knew my game. My game, if yeah. I, my goal when I hit the baseball, I want to be standing on second base after it. If that, that's my goal every at bat, not, not to be trotting around the bases. If that happens, great. You know, I'm never going to not you know, try not to hit home runs. But at the same time, I think we're just creating too, too much of a premium on home runs and extra base hits for younger kids or even at, at the pro level. And we're, we're letting strikeouts and bad at bats slide too much. We, we have to have more accountability as coaches, coaches and instructors at any level that, hey, man, you know, be an all-around hitter. You know, we, we don't, I don't think we have that many in the middle parts of the game. You know, there's – there's 300 plus hitters in, in, in Major League Baseball, but even in, at the Major League level, last year there were more punch outs than hits. That's unbelievable. That's crazy. That's crazy. I, that. I heard Kevin Wilson talk. I listened to Kevin's podcast, and Kevin's a, a private hitting guy. And, and I was listening the other day, and he said, for the first time ever in baseball history, there were more strikeouts for all 30 teams than hits. You, in my opinion, like, what are we doing? Like, why, why is the game going in this? Is that really okay? You know, I, I don't know. Yeah, and it's, it's hard, like you said, like, earlier how like the stats don't always tell the whole picture and obviously we can tell more from these advanced stats than ever but when you say like okay this guy like Joey Gallo was a great example where he hit like what 220 with like 40 jacks right, yeah. and still had like a good war like two right. or three or something but it's like well who did he hit those home runs off of like what situations did he not come through in? I know we have like leveraged stats too and all that stuff but you know as a pitcher it when you know like okay like Pitchers go into bear down mode. Like, it's second and third and two outs. I've got a base open. Like, I'm going to just, like, stab this guy with every little weakness in his armor right. that, I, you know, that I know of. So when you get a guy like that who you're like, okay, he strikes out a ton. He swings and misses. I'm, like, you just smell blood, and it just seems like you have a pretty easy path to get him out right. from the get-go unless you just really fail to execute. Right. Whereas guys that have a pretty balanced approach in a situation like that are, are very tough to like find your way through that it's not like okay i just get one strike on this guy and then it's breaking ball breaking ball breaking ball until he misses one because right. that seems like what's happening a lot at yeah higher levels no now. it does whereas yeah. guys it's like okay he can identify the breaking ball so all right can i get ahead with a fastball is that safe you know and if i do where do i miss off if i'm gonna miss because i have a base open there's a mm -hmm. big situation and or do i need to go with a breaking ball early like what it just makes you have to have a stronger game plan and it's you know it's still chance until they do swing the bat right. and when guys have that balanced swing and a decent approach and aren't aren't afraid to like just spray the ball and put the ball in play it, it it's tough for a pitcher to get out of those jams right. and so you wonder how many times those swing and those big like all or nothing guys you know hit a meaningless two, two run home run and then strike out in situations like that where the best pitchers bear down with their right. best stuff. Like right. if Chris Sale is going to bear down and you're an easy strikeout, he's going to strike yeah, you out. You're going to get a hit 0% right. of the time. Yeah. But he might give you a cookie once in a while when it doesn't matter that much because he's just trying to get ahead or whatever, mm -hmm. cruise, cruise, and you hit a meaningless home run. Right. So it, it's also just unclear where some of these, you know, if that's the best way to go about it. And it's not to say you have to, like, give up that. It's not to say that Joey Gallo is necessarily better if he – changes his approach in right. some way and hits 30 home runs and 10 extra doubles or whatever but it's yeah, like i said I, I i agree with you i think it's it's a it's a troubling direction and, and maybe in five years we have more mm -hmm. perspective on it like yeah. what it's actually done to the game baseball's but. typically been pretty cyclical it'll come back and you know maybe the the new sexy thing will be a 400 on base percentage and guys will be a little bit more passive or you know making sure that they're staying inside the zone but you know, it, I think it comes down to what's your end game. Is your end game what your stats look like at the end of the season? And is that what you're going to get paid on? Is that what you're going to get based your performance on? Well, you know what? If that's the case right now, if I had to play a season right now and, and all that mattered was how many home runs I hit and it didn't matter my on-base percentage or my batting average, I would go and absolutely take donkey hacks and probably catch an, a 20 home runs or whatever, more than my, ever that my career stats show. But my everything else would suffer. And I don't think that's – that's not really going to help the team because, like you said, how many home runs are going to be in a 10-0 blowout? I hit a two-run home run, we lose 10-2. Yeah. If you're – if or as against a, the worst pitcher. Against like, exactly, you know, the, yeah. The, the mop-up guy. Exactly, on a Sunday or a spot starter or something like that, you know? And, and, and do those really hold the same weight as the walk-off home run or the home run a tie game in the seventh? It's not even close. Or the good at-bat where you walk to pass a torch to the next guy who hits a home run. Those things go – 
should be valued the same. And I think we're getting to the point where we value guys at the analytical level. Th there's some pretty deep stuff that's talked about now. And I think the, the analytics of the game at any level and the approach of the game, they're, they're on different tracks. I think they're two different conversations. You can't, in my opinion, you can't really blend them both together. A guy's approach and the, the ang attack angle and how long his bat's in the zone and the type of swing he has is different than tracking on base percentage and OPS plus and, you know, all these different things that they have, you know, now with TrackMan and, and hit tracks and all this stuff. I think it's all good, but you, we just have to use it in the right way. And I think it's so new that we're all like little puppies. We're trying to find our way. What's the best way to feed our players information? And I don't know if we have that right now. I think at the big league level, they're the closest, if not the best, clearly. I mean, they have analytical departments loaded with people. So they're on the right track analytically and data driven wise. But then on the flip side, trying to you know, what, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to be a good all-around hitter and, and try to, you know, put together three, four good at-bats and help the team win? Great. Are you trying to just lift the ball and, and catch a couple out in front and say you hit 10 home runs, 20 home runs this year? That's the wrong way to go about it, in my opinion. So Yeah, and I, and I think the, the analytics departments are, are helping guys like you who they can shine more light onto, you know, like, hey, he's a really good defender. Like, he provides a lot of value to our team, whereas in the past there was no real way to quantify that. Right. So there's, like – there's so much stuff that's just like going on. We're, like you said, we're, we're sorting it out. We're trying to mesh it together. It's maybe working, maybe not. It just depends on, it's just, it's just a really interesting conversation the way the game's just changing. Yeah. It's and that, hard and to make sense of it. Everyone wants right. to like have the full answer now. Right. But it's like, if you look at the history of anything, you know, like we have microwaves now. You yeah. know, seven <laughs> yeah. years ago, you could, I don't know if microwaves get emitted naturally anything yeah, right. but like what if your food was just sitting there and got cooked yeah. You'd be like hey like you know yeah. it's it's it's, <laughs> it's, it's a miracle yeah. creature in the sky cooking yeah. my food for me yeah. but then like later you figure like no it's microwaves or like this right. and that like we've we've figured out things over time uh like we have cameras that capture the light and like make it into a video it's like everything in the it's world crazy. is mind-blowing yeah so you wonder like what we figure out in like five ten years where it's like oh yeah all that stuff that we're everyone's butting heads yeah, we figured it out. Right. Yeah. And chances are, in 2029, we, we'll probably have a bit better grasp, uh, grasp on this whole thing, you yeah. know? And, It'll and probably be simple, too. It's like, yeah, you can strike out a little bit more than you could in 2010, but not as much as you could in 2018. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And, and there'll be some new thing that we're talking about. It, it, it's, it's always going to happen. I just think, you know, technology today is at the highest it's ever been. The, the cameras in the ballparks, I think I heard something in the when the Astros were in the ALCS against the Red Sox this year. How many cameras? hundreds of cameras in their in their ballpark just to track as much data and get yeah. as accurate information as possible how can you say that that's not good of course it's good they're using the technology to evaluate and develop their players but who's doing the developing and who's saying on twitter or a, a high school coach who's saying that they know but they really don't you know i think too many people are quick to say oh, I figured this out and I'm going to go to work yeah. and I'm going to start a facility and start my own Twitter handle and just preach like I know what I'm doing when really you didn't really do the you're not in the trenches every day you don't really know for sure how how this whole thing operates so I, I think there's just a little bit of a miscommunication and once that gets tied up hopefully soon I think we'll get back to regular you know normal baseball where there's more hits and stuff like that than strikeouts yeah so, man that's a crazy stat it's, yeah. it's just one of those worlds where no one wants like when, when I was writing fitness articles, I learned early from my editor. He's like, no one wants, like, here's here's five things you should probably do that are like pretty much good, but you know there might be a better way to do it. Kind of article. You can't like, you have to be like black and white. Like, here's five things you must do when you bench press. Right. You know what I mean? And that's still kind of the world that I feel like the news and journalism and talk radio they operate in. Like, you don't if you're a paid if you're like Scott Van Pelt or one of these people, you're not paid to give maybes you're right. paid to like have an opinion and voice it right so then the people can go back and forth and they can have their discussion but like you have to draw your line in the sand with everything right and you know we i feel like you said you have that gut reaction you're like oh i hate that kid swing you're teaching him wrong you're teaching him wrong but yeah. it's this is a really good time i think just to wait and see unfortunately mm -hmm. Because it's just like the verdict's just not out. Yeah, right. And it's just tough. And it's just tough to see a kid that, in my again, yeah, I could be totally sure. wrong too, but uh, you know, you're to see, probably not. To, yeah, <laughs> to, probably not. to see a seven-year-old kid, you know, scooping up and underneath a ball and training that way and being told, "Good, good job, buddy. You know, you're doing good," yeah. and just knowing that any kind of velocity 
really from the knees up is going to beat him. And when he does strike the ball like he's getting taught, it's a pop-up because he's just not physically there. That's sad to see because maybe that kid's really talented. And maybe that kid, if taught a different way or a more yeah. sound fundamental approach for a 7- to 12-year-old that has no physical strength, no man strength whatsoever, never touched a weight in his life, if they're taught how to be successful at the game, and you know what? If Put it this way. I'd rather have – a young kid, say a JV kid, you know, 14, 15 years old. I'd rather have him hit 30 singles a year and two doubles than hit four home runs, two doubles, and three singles and hit 220. I just, and, and it's not about the type of production or the type of hit. It's about finding a way to hit the ball and end up on first or second and hit the ball and find green. There's a skill and an yeah. art to – Having a game plan, having a scouting report, how am I going to beat this pitcher today? I'm not just going to be so locked into my own swing where, oh, by the way, someone's trying to, on the other end, get me out and throw a three-pitch mix at me, and I have to figure out how to do that. When you put all that together in a blender, it's just, I think, too much at the younger levels to, to, for kids to you know, compute in their head. So then they end up not playing, and, and eventually, you know, we're going to – hopefully the game doesn't get watered down, but – I think you have to be physically ready to make some of these jumps that are being presented to us technology-wise. So. Yeah, because, you know, back in the day on the Sandlot, if you like baseball and you want to go play, like, you just had to hit the ball with your barrel and, like, yeah. hit it good and, like, yeah. get on base. And then you're, like, playing baseball. Yeah. But now it's so confusing. It's just like any other skill. Like, you've been, you know, launching your podcast, and there's so many things that it's, you have to learn. It's so irritating. You're like, you just want to be like, ah, screw it. I'll just right. go do something else. And when baseball is like that, Oh, I have to do this. I have to focus on this. I have uh, all these different things. You can't just like go play. It's not right. play anymore. Like, exactly. Like the Sandlot it's days. It's kind of taking the fun out of it. You know, it's 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 like a math project. It shouldn't be. Hey, if you keep your barrel in the zone, you hit the ball in the barrel. Good things are going to happen. Don't get blown up. Don't hit it off the end. If you can hit the ball in the barrel as much as possible, and if you get on base in any capacity, you're helping the team win. Pass the torch to the next guy. If that's the mentality, I think more winning baseball, better cultures will come up, come back. And more kids will want to play the game. But until that, if, if, if the end goal is just, you know, lift the ball or, or power, 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 and don't worry about your batting average, just hit the, hit the ball of the fence, it, it, it's too hard. Hitting a home run is, in my opinion, or anything on a baseball field, but specifically hitting the ball as far as you can over the fence, probably one of the hardest things to do in all of sports, just hitting the ball, period, you know. Uh, Not so for me. You ever seen this damn no, picture? No, yeah, <laughs> raked. <laughs> no, I was, I was hitting top spin line drives in the outfield yeah. and – putting the bat away because mm -hmm. I was cranky <laughs> but uh so we could probably talk all day um but we should probably wrap how yeah. can my viewers find you and your podcast and what you do and, and learn more about you on a long-term basis so my podcast is named 543 um it'll be launched in Why early call that 543 uh I played third Mm -hmm. And uh, in my first episode, I explained why. But for uh, anyone new, um, basically, I, I played third base, but my, one of my most favorite things to do was turn double play. And feeding the second baseman and, and getting double play, getting two outs on one uh, in one pitch is one of the best things you could do other than a triple play. So I love that. But also, part of, uh, part of this whole thing is that I hit into a lot of 5-4-3 double plays. <laughs> It's true. So my, my the whole reason I named it that, it's a little spin that I played third and I love doing it, but also every baseball player hits into them. So my podcast is going to be based on my successes and failures and try to teach as many people as I can. Failing's okay, but it's not okay enough to, you know, just use that as an excuse. We have to try to get better. So it's a it's a little bit of, of that saying, okay, you're going to do good and bad things on a baseball field. Hit, you're going to turn them, and you're going to hit into them, and let's try to meet in the middle and, and, and kind of tell my story through both my not just all the good things I did, but also probably many more bad things, um, just failures I've had, you know, tough times, and, and that kind of equates to me. And um, I think it'll be, I'll try to get my podcast out on as many platforms as possible, and, and I have a couple good guests lined up and, and a couple solo things I'm going to talk about and – and try to keep it to a manageable time for a drive and, and just try to educate anybody um, that wants to hear me talk about my experiences and also my thoughts. And I have a, a nice group of people that follow me back in New York. And since I moved here uh, la at the end of last year, um, I miss those people, a lot of the kids I did lessons with and, and parents and, and just families and friends. So this is a way for them to hear what I have to say and, and chime in and get in touch with me on Twitter and 
And if anyone has any suggestions for me or anything like that, I'm, I'm open to it. I want this to be as interactive as possible for people. That's awesome. What's so. your uh, Twitter handle or any other social media? Twitter handle is at Steve Marino 14. Um, and I don't use Instagram and I, uh, uh, Facebook is just Steven Marino on Facebook. Okay. Uh, I'll post so links in the description below and I all that. I appreciate that. So, that. Yeah. yeah. No, it's great. And I, you know, I enjoyed being on the show and, um, I love what you talk about and the guests you have are, are top notch and I'm a avid listener and it's great and appreciate I appreciate it. you having me on. All right. Well, thanks for being here. Uh, this was episode 72 of Dear Baseball Gods. So if you're listening on Spotify, YouTube, iTunes, Stitcher, my website, thanks again for showing up and don't forget my new YouTube vlog is underway. So I know we didn't cover it, but I'm gonna leave it as a cliffhanger. Um, check out my vlog. Episode four is gonna feature this guy and our little sort of twist of fate and how he fit into my story on one of the toughest days of my career when I was playing against Stony Brook. So thanks again, and we'll see you next week on Dear Baseball Gods.